Hi again, it's Ryan Miller with Aetna Interactive, and it's good to be back with you today because we're going to be talking about a somewhat serious and timely topic. We're going to talk about the appropriate use of social media in the medical practice environment. Now, by now, I think many of us are familiar with Dr. Wendell Davis Boutte, um, uh, known as the Dan Dancing Doctor in the uh, popular media. Now, obviously, she was after her 15 minutes of fame when she began. Um, publishing videos of her singing and dancing while patients were anesthetized in her operating room uh, and uh, has received a tremendous amount of criticism. Not only that, uh, very recently she reached an agreement uh, within her state uh, to the uh, uh, agree to the suspension of her medical license for about two and a half years. Now some of you are saying, ah, you know, Ryan, uh, that's not me. I would never make such a, a, a huge mistake. I have much better judgment. Does this really apply? And the answer is yes, because if you joined us just a couple of months ago for our HIPAA webinar, you recall that there's actually been a spate of similar disciplinary actions for um, things that were published on behalf of staff or on behalf of agencies that are working for medical practices. So really we're taking a broad look today at the appropriate use of social media for anyone that might be publishing on behalf of the practice. Because we have a couple of you know, fairly existential questions that we have to be thinking about. As marketing is moving from more traditional media or traditional online media towards social media, uh, what do we have to do today to stand out? And it may be this question that's driving people to ever more sensational postings. At the same time, we have to recognize that it may be your medical license that's at risk, but the posts are very often today coming from members of your staff or agencies that you've hired. And I think on a much broader level, we have to step ask, back and ask, what do we really feel is appropriate as it relates to social media postings from medical professionals? And do the postings of the few have a negative reflection on these medical or our medical specialties as a whole? Now, why is it? What's the drive that's pushing us all towards social media? As far back as 2015, I think the data was fairly clear. You know, RealSelf did a study. They asked patients directly what were their preferences and their interests as it related to connecting with doctors on social media. And well, the Huffington Post came out with this story titled that non-social doctors are terribly outdated. Now, where that was coming from really was inspired by these two data points, that 95% of patients expected their, their physician to be at least somewhat active on social media, although the majority, 66% said, eh, I'm not likely to actually connect with you. Uh, we call this cyber stalking, right? That, that patients wanna see what you're doing. They're interested in what's happening in the practice. And in order to fulfill that wish, to share with them what's going on, we need to step back. And we're gonna be taking a look at three things today. Um, ultimately, what is it, why is it that practices are getting in trouble on social media? Because I think understanding the problem goes a long way in helping us prevent it. What are the best practices that relates to physicians? And what policies do you need to have in place to protect yourself and your practice? Now let's pause for a second here. We're gonna go a little bit longer than our typical um, newsletter distribution because our hope is that this is gonna be a resource, a resource not only for your own edification, but for training your existing staff, perhaps for using this as you onboard new members of your team who'll be active in social media on behalf of the practice. Now let's dive right in. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the research shows right now that uh, infractions are abound, that we see more and more reports from both state medical licensing um, boards here in the United States uh, and from Royal Colleges up in Canada, that there are an increasing number of infractions that involve disciplinary action that relate directly to social media. So the problem is on the rise. The most common offenses that are reported that are resulting in disciplinary action are these. So let's take a moment to just run through them. Inappropriate contact, so um, uh, with patients, this is sexual misconduct. Um, inappropriate prescribing or the inappropriate practice of medicine, so um, establishing a patient relationship with a patient you've never actually met. Misrepresenting your credentials or your clinical outcomes. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about what we need to do about each of these. Violations of patient confidentiality. Clearly we talked about some of these in the HIPAA webinar just a, a few weeks ago. Um, defamatory language, profanity, things that are directed at a patient or um, a coworker that are gonna get you in trouble. And then as we saw again with Dr. Boutte there, uh, inappropriate behaviors that are depicted on social media. So these are the things we need to watch out for. What are the best practices that protect you and protect your practice? Now, let's pause here for a second again and think about the expansive nature of our advice. We're not lawyers, so we're not giving you legal advice, but this is applicable things that you're doing on, on email, uh, the content that you publish on your website, the text communications that you may be having today with patients, blogs that you publish, and of course, 
the broader and specific context that we're talking about the social networks. Now, let's, let's go through some specific advice here. When we're posting, we need to put our posts in context. And if we have a bias, we need to share that bias inside the posts so that patients can understand how to interpret what they're gonna see as medical advice from you or from your practice. So if you have a financial, professional, or personal conflict, be sure that you include it inside the post. And be sure that you're not representing your clinic, misrepresenting your clinical outcomes and overstating what you can realistically achieve. We all need to be mindful of maintaining our integrity. I think the last thing that we want is to be active on social media and have it undermine our own moral values. So the basics of medical marketing are these. Avoiding false, fraudulent, and misleading statements are absolutely critical. Now, if you're drawing upon scientific and clinical knowledge, we want to make sure that our content conforms to the standards of care. Right, that we're giving good medical advice. Um, and finally, in this particular section, if we're, we're giving specific advice, which we generally recommend against, well, we need to be sure they indicate whether it's based on scientific studies, expert consensus, or just your own personal and professional experience. Now, great example here of what can go wrong, especially when you're sharing things without consent. In this particular case, a story from the Tyler Morning Tel Telegraph about a plastic surgeon who shared some video of a patient without uh, taking steps to protect that patient's privacy. Now, keeping in mind that the photos and videos that you publish on the web, um, that things as subtle as the file names and metadatas go out into the public web when you publish those, those assets. So if you have a picture of a patient that contains their last name and you publish that directly to Facebook, it's not going to be de-identified and you need to take the steps to do that yourself. In addition to that, we always need to get express consent, specifically written consent, before we publish pictures or videos of our patients onto the web. Now, if your forms don't expressly mention social media as one of the uses, it's time to update those forms. Drop us a note, we'll direct you to a great resource that's provided by Medical Justice. Now, this is an actual post. It's hard to believe, but this is a real post that appeared on social media, and we, we see what's happening in the, as we kind of glance through the text here, that we see one medical professional lambasting one of their colleagues uh, for some decisions that were made in this particular case in the emergency room. Now, clearly, bad idea in terms of both the defamatory nature of this, uh, this post, but also the, the potential that this has for inciting a medical malpractice lawsuit. So we wanna be careful that we're avoiding defamation. I think this hopefully goes without saying, but we don't want to go after um, any of our colleagues. We don't want to attack the reputation of a patient on the public web. Now, it's not just an attack that might get us in trouble. Complaining is a problem that's fairly rampant as well. In this example, also taken from the headlines, we see an OBGYN um, uh, complaining about a late patient. We see colleagues commiserating, um, all of them missing the fact that their discussion was visible on the public internet. And uh, there's quite a backlash from the body of patients who had seen this practice. And so those kinds of complaints we need to keep to ourselves. And the basic advice there is simply to be professional, right? So um, act on social networks as we would in person and as if the people that we're talking about are standing in the room with us. Be sure that you set clear guidelines for yourself, that you've thought it through, and ideally that you've written guidelines as well for the members of your staff who will be participating on social media on behalf of the practice. Now, um, if you are publishing before and after photos, if you're publishing videos of procedures, um, be sure that you've got some guidelines for you and for your team on how to de-identify that information so that we're protecting patient privacy. And then um, we have a specific recommendation for those doctors who have both personal social media profiles and professional profiles, and that's that you get used to politely declining social connections from patients on your personal profiles and that you can guide those people to connect with you on your professional social media accounts. Now, maintaining boundaries is really just an extension of that same idea. Um, obviously, you should not be initiating a doctor-patient relationship with someone that you've never met, so don't be, don't be uh, practicing on strangers on social media. Be mindful about the details of your own personal life. Um, details as subtle as what's contained in the photos that you place on your social media accounts. Um, you know, be mindful about what you reveal there, and of course, Avoid any online relationships with current or former patients, right? Not a good idea to get too close personally on social media with someone that you're also treating. Now, let's talk about protecting as we wrap up here, both your person and your practice. You know, recognizing that if you're the medical director of a center, you're responsible for everything that's published in the name of that practice. So let's be sure and be aware that privacy settings, well, they're not as transparent as they should be. Despite what I think are the best efforts of the major social media players, it can be quite complex to control um, and clearly understand who's seeing what you're publishing. 
So understand how you can configure privacy settings to protect your information and assume that everything that you share, well, that it's going to become publicly available regardless of how you've set those, uh, those privacy considerations. Now, recognize as well that once it's shared, it may be shared forever. Don't plan on being able to delete anything that you publish online. Now, for those of you, especially those of you that are either um, younger inside of a practice, that are just getting started on their professional careers, and you aren't your own boss, if you ever hope to be hired, it's a good idea to assume that your, former, your future employer is likely to perform a background check of some kind. That they'll be uh, taking a look at your activity online, and they'll be considering well, the quality of your post and the style and types and the nature of the connections that you form on social media. Now, to check yourself, we recommend you simply begin by Googling your full name. Look through all of your old social posts. Look through your social connections and the groups to which you belong and ask yourself, well, are my employer likely to object to anything that's out there? You may want to consider making edits or revisions to your public profile. We do also recommend that practices consider formal policies. It's important that you check here with human resources lawyers that you work with inside of your practice and in your state because from one state and province to the next, the laws about what you can regulate for your employees differ. Now, definitely we recommend that every practice protect their passwords. Fortunately, we've seen far too many cases where a practice separates from an employee only to find that the passwords are attached to and the user accounts for social media are attached to that departing employee who then has the control to edit or, well, simply destroy the accounts that are built in the name of the practice. So password protection is an important part of protecting your assets on social media. Um, identify and articulate clearly to each member of your staff who is actually allowed to participate on social media on behalf of the practice and establish a clear human resources policy that talks about what your expectations are and what the risks are surrounding their participation inside of social space. Um, we also recommend for practices that have either staff or agency publishing on their behalf that you have some clear protocols about when it's required for members of your leadership team to approve text and content before it goes out. So pulling all of those ideas together, you know, we just need to recognize that disciplinary action for medical practice participation on social media, it's on the rise. And it's up to you to understand and adopt, well, those best practices that are going to keep you safe. In addition to just following best practices, some of those prophylactic actions that we, that we recommended there that are intended to protect you and articulate in advance for the people who are participating on social media um, what they should and should not do are really some of the best ways that you can protect yourself now and into the future. And of course, if you want to learn more, well, you can be sure that you're subscribed to our newsletter so that you receive our video broadcasts each and every month. You can follow us on social media or maybe leave a review for the content on Facebook as well. And of course, my name is Ryan Miller. I welcome your questions directly at ryan at Thanks for tuning in today. We'll look forward to seeing you next month.